parks, schools, restaurants, and more, Assembly Row gets high scores. We're a thriving city with so much to do. Uncle Boston Harbor in our view. Politics, cannabis, controversial stories, heroes, and villains. Who gets the glory? 50 plus languages in Somerville are spoken. Sanctuary City, there are no free tokens. History in Somerville stays alive. In all American City, we won three times. Somerville connects. Somerville connects. Welcome to another edition of Somerville Connect. We have the amazing Alex Silverman. Welcome, Alex. Thank you so much, Jojo. It's great to be here. Thank you. So, Alex, you wrote a book called Hitchin. Hitchin, which is, it's an adventure. So, Alex, before we get into the book, tell us a little bit about yourself our viewers, our listeners, because we don't know a whole lot about you. And tell us and tell us how you got from where you were to Hitchin across America. Sounds good. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so my yeah, my name's Alex Silverman. I'm from uh, Cambridge originally. I grew up in Cambridge. Um, and I've traveled and lived a lot of uh, different places across the country and a little bit out of the country as well. And I uh, work a few different jobs, but I work uh, primarily as an outdoor educator. So instructing uh, young people in different skills in the outdoors. Um, so that actually translated pretty well to going hitchhiking cross country. Going all the way from uh, Boston, all the way across to jump into the ocean in Santa Cruz, California. Um, that is, that's quite a journey to go from Boston all the way to the west coast so you did it with your thumb out like this is that is that how they still do it yeah a thumb and a, <laughs> yep a thumb and a, a cardboard sign with exactly where you want to go is very useful. isn't that a little bit scary like you don't know who's gonna stop on the side of the road who's gonna pick you up is it gonna be someone that's sane is it gonna be someone that's talkative is it going to be someone that's crazy? Do those thoughts ever go through your mind? Definitely, definitely. And it's definitely something to be concerned of. I tended to, uh, I mean, there are a few sketchy rides here and there, but I tended to luck out on the trip for sure. Um, and then there's also in the book a number of tips along the way to kind of be a little bit helpful. And you always have to do stay aware as to where you are and how other people are feeling and kind of reading people pretty well. Are there certain hours of the day that it's best to hitch a ride across America? Yeah, so I mainly hitchhiked while it was light out. So it was pretty easy camping out. I was mainly sleeping in a sleeping bag and camping out outside. Um, and I'd get up a lot of the time, a little bit after sunrise and, uh, and just start in the morning is good. Um, and definitely the times that there's the most traffic is hugely beneficial. So morning rush hour, oh. evening rush hour, it's definitely, definitely useful. But I rarely have ever hitchhiked at night. It was, you know, I might've gotten a ride right as the sun was going down, but, uh, but pretty much did not hitchhike at night. It was also helpful that it was summertime, people were a little more relaxed, they were a little more up for an adventure. And do you do you have like a checklist that you, all the things that you took with you before you hitch in a ride, you say, geez, I need uh, water, I need Band-Aids. I mean, what are the things that someone takes with them before they hitch a ride across America? What types of things did you carry with you? Yeah, so it just for any outdoor survival stuff, you can kind of go with um, one way to look at it is there's a Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs. So the first thing that you're going to want is your survival needs. So you're going to want to be aware of shelter, water. I mean, a really basic one would be air, but we weren't. I wasn't swimming too much, so didn't didn't really add in that one too much. But um, yeah, so I had a sleeping bag. Small backpack. I'll raise it up real quick. Um, but this is actually the backpack that I took. I don't know how clear it is. And then yeah, it's kind of hot to see how big it is because it's pretty. Oh, small. okay, but got it, was it. Just a day, a day backpack anyway, and a uh, and a regular uh, sleeping bag. And uh, I would also have a rolled up sleeping pad 
and that could be used for multiple uh, reasons, but it was really good for insulation as well. Making sure that when you laid down and then that was on the ground, your body wasn't changing temperature too much in terms of hot or cold. And where did you shower, wash your clothes, change your underwear, all that stuff that someone thinks about? So it didn't, it, you know, I didn't do that too often, but also I did. Yikes! Take clothes, ah, yeah. <laughs> I did take clothes with me that were synthetic. So synthetic clothes are really helpful and ones that can dry quickly. Quick dry clothes help you with that as well. But I did, um, you know, I got showers from some people who uh, picked me up, a Canadian family picked me up um, when I entered Ontario from Niagara Falls. And so I showered at their house. They were nice enough to give me a shower and I showered at a few other houses along the way. But it didn't take too long. The way out there just took three and a half weeks. And then the rest was a bit longer going up and down the West Coast and then uh, finished up in New Mexico. So folks, we have Sarah here. Sarah and I belong to the same film group, Somerville Film Group. She introduced me to Alex. So chime in here, Sarah. What do you want to say? Because I know that you have a lot of great questions too. I want to hear about what you packed and I guess how long it took you to pack and was it a, I know you had, from talking to you previously, you had planned on doing this, but how much time did you actually plan with, you know, food that you were going to pack, um, just some of the logistics, I guess, I'm very interested in. Sure thing, sure thing. Um, yeah, so um, we went through a few things already. So uh, sleeping bag, sleeping pad. Um, I also had our rain gear, rain gear top, rain gear bottoms. I had a fleece as well. And I had a knife more as a tool for eating and anything, but it does also double up as some protection if needed as well. Um, and a uh, few other tools i may have had packed a compass i didn't need it and then along the way what i did um because i mainly just picked up food along the way is um in the morning what i would have is i would have uh bagels and then i would have whipped cream cheese because it wouldn't go bad there's less water in whipped cream cheese and then for both lunch and dinner i would a lot of times have beans or chili and I'd mix that in with peanut butter. And those would just be cans that you can get from a gas station. But the key thing about that is that it's high in protein. And, um, and I prepared, I would say, for a few months before. And what I did is with Google Maps, just to give me an idea, is I mapped out the general route that I probably wanted to go and what, what might be best. So I mapped out the route and the key spots were going from Boston up to Niagara Falls and then going over to Lake Michigan and then seeing from Lake Michigan um, what exactly the route was over to Santa Cruz, California. So Alex, did you choose to pick roads that were more, um, where there was more traffic? I know you said you, you already was doing your hitchhiking at high levels of traffic, but the roads that you traveled were they major highways or were they side roads, scenic roads? What was your choice? Yeah, so they were both. So to start out from the Boston area, I didn't think I was gonna have good luck on the interstates. So what I did have in Massachusetts, as I've said in other interviews before, is the toughest, um, was the toughest place to hitch out of. And sometimes your home is just the toughest place to hitch out of because you're getting used to things as well. But um, I took Route 9 from the Newton Highland Green Line Station. Yeah, yeah. And so that, and I walked out on Route 9, and that's where I got my first rides, going out to central Massachusetts. So yeah, out to Worcester and then out to Ware. Um, and that's a nice combination because it's still kind of technically a highway, but uh, the cars aren't going too fast. If the cars are going too fast, they're not going to stop you. And it's also more dangerous. And, and who was the first person that picked you up? Tell us about your first. Yeah, so the first person was a guy named Kenneth. And it was a short ride and it was on the road to Worcester. And he was just a real nice guy. He had uh, hitchhiked and it helped also if people had hitchhiked before, then they were more likely to pick you up. He had hitchhiked with his girlfriend in New Zealand. 
and uh, he worked for an organic veggie farm um, out towards Worcester in that direction. And so he was nice and he just, he got me, you know, a few blocks down the road. And then I got uh, picked up by a guy who um, had been involved in some festivals, but he was uh, he was uh, kind of uh, moving objects back and forth in Central Mass. Sarah? Um, did you, when people would um, pick you up, you would give them directions as to around where you wanted to go. Um, did how what was I guess the most generous people the longest route that you went on um, did people go way out of their way for you or was it more oh hey I'm going 10 miles this way I'm just going to drop you off in the middle of nowhere how did that work <laughs> yeah. so both, both things definitely happened you know at one point later on I got dropped off in the middle of the Mojave Desert and kind of a uh, I wouldn't even call it a ghost town, it was barely a village and I got dropped off there, it was super hot. So that was one of the worst times I got dropped off. But then also um, in central Massachusetts with uh, my friend Brandon, friend that I made from the trip, he drove me all the way from central Massachusetts on a whim to Niagara Falls. So, you know, he was, he was up for an adventure and he did that. And then this grandmother, uh, Caitlin, she drove me all the way from, I believe, Dubuque, Iowa, and she was heading out that way anyway, but that was all the way to uh, Colorado, beginning of Colorado, Utah area. Were you? Yeah, so that, you know, that was pretty far, but you get farther if you keep talking to people a lot of the time and you keep the conversation going. And then, you know, some people, I think I even drive 30 or 60 miles out of their way. So that really helps us. So tell us about um, one of your most interesting conversations that you had? Um, I think, well, this was kind of a wild time. This guy, I got picked up later on in the trip by this guy um, from Indiana who was just blasting his speakers with a really loud rap music the whole time. And he was a big character and he was out there and he was and and he was married at the time but he was seeing this young woman who had been a stripper and um you know had been a stripper and he was kind of rolling down rolling down the road and we got stopped by the police and they and he allowed his car to be searched so that was a whole adventure but in terms of advice i would say that um uh, Caitlin, who is a grandmother, was one of the more interesting people in general because she had a, she had a lot of advice that she wanted to uh, tell me, just in general. And we were riding along in her white convertible in Iowa, and so she had lived a lot of life. And she she talked about how she grew up with her parents and um, how she thought things should be done a certain way, and that there uh, back when she was growing up, the adults still had their adult time. And, was kind of adorable. The kids would wait by the banister and see her mother and her father together talking. And so that kind of was her image of how a relationship should be. So that that got a little bit more personal. And she talked to me about this guy that she had met and been with who was a reverend, but he just wasn't used to kids. And so that had been a tough time. So people to and people also tend to share things because they're they're unlikely to see you again. So you know, they get things off their chest a lot of the time because, you know, you're just an open ear and you're there and you're probably going to be gone soon enough anyway. Sarah, I know you have a, a I could see the steam. I guess what was the, would you say is maybe some of the top or the top advice you took away from this trip? If you, you know, at, did you have an aha moment or from either a conversation you had with someone or a situation? Yeah, I think it's, I think by the end of the trip, it was a kind of overall perspective, especially because I met so many people along the way, is being able to see people from multiple angles, both kind of like up close and, and personal, and also how they felt they may belong or not belong in society as a whole, um, and see them positively. And one, one example of that is I met up with this crew of kind of like punk kids, punk kids, or a little bit hippied out kids on the road. 
and just seeing these two young guys who are traveling on the road or kind of getting out and having some fun. Um, they were in a Walmart and they were playing with a scooter and then seeing an older man from his perspective who thought, oh, they were just messing about and going to cause trouble in a Walmart. And they both had completely different perspectives on life. And it was hard to tell who was more justified or who was more right, but it's just seeing two people interact like that. Were you ever scared at all at any point of time? Well, I, I wouldn't frame it in terms of scare, but I'd say in terms of, yeah, there were definitely times of higher risk, but I kind of felt that it helped filter that through an outdoor frame of mind. And so there's definitely times where your ears pick up or like go, hey, is uh, somebody hitting on me or about to, or do I need to change the conversation here a bit? So, but um, I was able to, one or two times that happened, kind of was able to steer the conversation or start asking them questions and kind of steer it away from stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah, and then there's times that you do need to be hyper aware just in terms of cars driving by really fast and where you're stood on an on-ramp. Um, so yeah, there's definitely the physical danger, physical, mental, emotional danger, and those vary with the context. Would you do it again? Um, yeah, it's like I've hitchhiked really small amounts here. There, I I probably would, but I but I, I then again I am really happy I did it at this point. Um, the adventures I've kind of moved on to a little bit is um, trying to hike higher and higher mountains. So. I think that's kind of the adventure now. So I need to get back down to South America and finally do one that's a little higher than Kilimanjaro before saving up for Kilimanjaro. So. And uh, also, I will say this, if anybody needs a, a primer and addition to the book, which is available on Amazon in both Kindle form and paperback, and also the audiobook should be coming out uh, soon for Audible, is that Dave Cho is another great place to get it. Dave Cho on YouTube. Spell it's that. Three Spell that please. Dave Cho. So D-A-V-E space C-H-O-E. He's another great person to um, get advice in terms of how to hitchhike and I definitely took some of my lessons from him. He's a famous famous graffiti artist and kind of wild guy but he has three seasons worth of doing hitchhiking and he has great tips along the way. So I want you to take us on a journey okay. through your book, because you mentioned at the beginning of this uh, conversation that you're an outdoor educator. I don't know what that means exactly, but I want to know how your education as an outdoor educator has helped you and take us on a journey of the book. Okay. Yeah, so the, the first thing uh, as an outdoor educator that I would say most importantly is those survival needs. It's just finding out what do you need to get by in the outdoors. So we already went through those, but you know, do you have enough water? Where are you going to get your water? Where are you going to get your food? Well, you know, where are you going to sleep that night? Is it a safe place to sleep? And just assessing all the different types of risks along the way. Um, and then, and the other thing is also being really intentional verbally in terms of with your words and how that can affect people, you know? And so, and also um, not completely as an outdoor educator, but like, how are you standing? How are, what's the perspective? How are other people seeing you when you have a sign out there? Do you look friendly? Are you making eye contact with them as, as well? Um, yeah, and then, in terms of getting into the trip, I would say just in general, confidence is going to come. It, I felt like it took about two weeks to get into the trip. So you just kind of have to push through with persistence to kind of get into the flow of things in general. Um, and and I, I feel like as I got more comfortable with the trip, I could less look at the map completely and just kind of go, all right, I'm getting up today. I'm doing the same thing. I'm going to hold up my side. I'm going to wait by the side of the road. And uh, you get to enjoy the trip a little bit rather than just being worried about potential risks or am I going to actually get a ride? Okay, I got some questions for you. Yeah. Um, where did you sleep every night? Okay, yeah, so that was very variable, but a lot of the time it could be, you know, every, anywhere from like sleeping by like a ditch by the on-ramp that happened to. So when I was lucky, I was in a more rural area. 
So right outside of a city, there'd be a bit of woods or even by an on-ramp, there'd be some trees to camp out a farm near a farmland. That would be better because then, you know, you might have to worry about animals, but honestly, most of the time animals aren't the most dangerous. They're, you know, other people are. <laughs> So yeah, so that's that's what I would say. So it's a lot easier in rural areas to just find somewhere to sleep than the city. Did you ever get bit by a bug uh, or or an animal, and you said, "Oh my God, I got this!" I and, and it slowed you down because I, you can get bit by a mosquito and get oh, yeah. totally debilitated. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so I didn't get bit in general. I mean, by mosquitoes and stuff like that. That did happen, but the major thing that happened was poison ivy. Oh. So, yeah. So I was camping out at not the best place in Niagara, and what ended up happening is uh, my hand, if it was the right or the left, but what ended up happening is I woke up and I was really bleary-eyed. And I started seeing these green little sprigs all around me and my hand was rubbing up against it and it was really itchy and down to my wrist. And I woke up more and more and then I realized I was surrounded by poison ivy where I had chosen to sleep. Because when I got in that night, it was dark. And, um, and so my hands started getting pretty infected. And luckily I bought a first aid kit that was as well in my backpack, real small. And it had some anti-itch creams, some antihistamines, and that really helped out, but it didn't really dry up. And that's a big thing as well if you get infections and why the West is so much easier in some ways for infections until I got out West and just the climate was a lot drier. And so that really helped my hand the most was just time and being in a drier environment but I carefully took a leaf and I took all those sprigs out from where I was sleeping to try to get them out. So, but yeah, yeah, it was looking pretty rough at that time. And what about just getting, being really cold at night um, where there's some nights where you just were really just shivering most of the night and didn't pack enough or? Yeah, so that wasn't too bad. I mean, I was, I was mainly in the middle of summer so that wasn't too too bad and that, but the key thing was is in terms of having multiple layers not just one heavy layer so having the sleeping bag having the fleeces and then having the rain gear which can be used to hold in all your heat and then also having that insulating uh, sleeping pad so when you sleep your body temperature isn't diving too much at night um so that that was the key thing but yeah had it been another season it would have it would have been a lot worse but I did, there was a time in Wisconsin where it started raining and I was under a tree and I got soaked and I just had to go underneath an on-ramp and I didn't sleep well at all that night, but I stayed drier. Yeah. But a lot of it was luck. It didn't, it only rained on me that one night. And I and I stayed a few times in, inside. There was some family and some people that I met along the way that took me in as well and that helped out. How long did it take you to hitchhike from Boston to the West Coast. Yeah, so the first part of the trip, which is Boston, the West Coast, took three and a half weeks only. So it did not take that long, relatively, for a person who's just holding out their thumb. So, because it takes about five days to drive clear across if you're doing it de somewhat decently. I mean, you can get across in three hours or like Hunter S. Thompson style, two days, but you're really pushing it. And the people who do that are usually taking something when they do that. But um, yeah, so three, three and a half weeks or so. Um, and then the rest of the trip took a bit longer, but I was more staying with people going back and forth. Would you say the majority of the people who picked you up were male or female? I'd say male and in generally, and mostly white guys. And in generally, I would say on average, you're gonna more often get picked up by the person you already look like. Oh. You know, so that doesn't mean that all the guys had beards, but it beards, but it was mostly white guys and, you know, a lot of the time single guys in, in general. So um, I would say that I'd say more women are more likely to pick up another woman. It's just it's just human nature in some respects. And also, who do you feel more safe with and more comfortable with? But I did get picked up by a variety of people. Did some people ask you to show them your license and like take that down just as like a safety measure? 
Yeah, so there was one girl in Wisconsin was the best place to hitchhike through, and she um, she ended up, uh, I think, taking a picture of my license, but she was, like, recording on her phone the whole time or and called someone, one of her friends. And I wasn't even in the car that long. She's an interesting person. Um, she was, I believe, working and staying at a local Buddhist monastery, but she was definitely more wary, mm-hmm. especially being a single woman, picking up a bigger guy, yeah. That was smart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, whatever whatever works for each person individually. Mm-hmm. What did your backpack weigh? Uh, yeah, well, it was a little bit heavy. I'd say, I mean, anywhere depends what I was carrying that day and how much food I'm beginning it. But I'd say anywhere from 35 to 50 pounds, more on the 35 pound, yeah. But I did not take much with me. I only had that small black day pack, sleeping bag, sleeping pad. So it was not much to take with me. And it was also summertime, which helps in a big way. That's that's a lot of weight to lug around. That's like taking a bag on the plane and it's gonna be under 50 pounds. That's a lot to carry around. Yeah, yeah. Well, you, it does, does have a waist strap as well. Um, yeah, and a lot of the times it was lighter. So by the end of the day, a lot of the things, like the cans of food really add some weight. <laughs> you, you really feel those. Um, and then sometimes, you know, by the end of the day or by the end of a couple of days when food is going, it, it did get a lot lighter at certain points of time. But yeah, you got to take, you got to take what you need. Definitely. Yeah. But you get, a, you get used to it. You have to get in hiking shapes. It takes, it takes about two weeks to feel, start feeling comfortable, make sure your shoulders, you know, you wear in your shoulders a little bit. And I did get lighter when I lost my boots. <laughs> that was for sure. And what about um, heating up food at all? You just, did you have everything just cold or? Yeah. Yeah. yeah for the most part. I mean, Unless I got like an occasional meal or occasional time eating out with friends or a person I would meet. For the most part, it was just those cans of um, chili or cans of beans and peanut butter and bagels and cream cheese. And then just had a spoon with that. And that was about it because, you know, more, you know, the more stuff you have, the heavier it is. Did you lose weight? (laughs) I think I probably did. Yeah, I probably, and you probably lost weight from the middle and then you gained, definitely gained some muscle in your legs. So definitely gained a lot of muscle because you spent a good amount of time walking. As well. What's the longest amount of time you had your thumb up before someone picked you up? Okay, yeah, so in general, I wouldn't wait maybe four hours, but I, but I, I usually not that long, but, and the thing is in general, I would get frustrated after a little bit. So like about an, after about an hour or 50 minutes or so, I might get, say, screw this and walk to the next exit if there was one, you know? Just take some rural roads or other roads, go right over to the next exit, just to move things along and also to feel like you're making progress. What did your sign say? Oh, I had a bunch of different signs. Some of them were more entertaining than others. A lot of the time it would just say the name of a highway or sometimes it, occasionally I would do a crass joke somebody would curse me out for. Not too often but like I had when I was just having fun I would just I put on a sign I-69 and then I put the smiley faces on the sign. That was a key thing. I tried to put a smiley face on most of my signs so that it was more welcoming. And I think subconsciously people were more likely to pick me up. But I had two for 69 because they're nine and six are opposites of each other. I put two upside down smiley faces with their tongues out. One guy didn't like it and cursed, but, but you know, it was entertaining. You get bored and you also have to have fun with it. Too. Yeah, you do. Yeah. So yeah. give us but the, give us one of your oh. uh, most exciting parts of your pitching a ride across America. We had a crew that turned out to be five people that we were rolling down through the desert in a black Dodge Ram and had all these different characters in it. A couple of real young guys and one guy who was closer to my age in his mid to late 20s at that time. And then we had one young woman, I think in her early 30s, who had a warrant out for her arrest. So that was a whole adventure, and she was uh, driving her motorcycle along, and they were trying to get marijuana from each other, but they both didn't have marijuana, but she ended up joining our crew and dropping off her motorcycle. 
and riding oh. with us for a while. And what was her warrant for? Uh, she she had had a domestic issue with her girlfriend. So th there was warrants out in the county that there was a warrant out in the county that we were rolling through in Nevada at the time. But so she she was like, all right, I'll join these guys. And the guys were going to uh, the Rainbow Gathering at the time. So she's kind of like, go out, have fun, maybe go to this festival. And But she joined the crew and kind of started fitting right in with them. And yeah, it was a, it was a funny group of people for sure. Did you know about the Rainbow Festival beforehand? And how much research did you do beforehand? Or were you just kind of more wherever wherever i get dropped off yeah 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 so they were going further than me at that time in oregon but, um because i was just heading out west at that time and i got to oregon later on but um they uh i had gone to burning man and, and i had heard a little bit but these guys had never been but they knew a little bit more than me and one of the guys in the van was a carney so he had just been around he, by then he was I think the oldest one in his mid 30s by then and he had just been hitching around the uh, roads and hopping trains for years and years um so I found out more about them but it's just uh it just springs up in national parks and it's kind of a hippie-ish or a little bit out there gathering and all these people kind of gather and they just say this is the site we're going to everybody come, come in Sometimes the Forest Service gets annoyed because they feel like it's invading, but they set up cook stations and kind of have a whole little community for a few weeks or so. Yeah. So did you make any lifetime friends, people that you're still in contact with? Yeah, I would say the main person besides friends I had before I went on the trip is uh, Brandon. And he's from central Massachusetts. And that's the guy who drove me all the way up to Niagara Falls. And now we're good. I saw him last night, so it was a great lead-in to the interview today. And he's doing well, and he's a really positive guy, and kind of wild at the same time. So do you think people are hitching rides across America with the COVID going on now, or are they a little bit more leery? I think it's a lot more difficult, probably a lot less likely to be picked up. Um, but I don't know, you'd have to see, because the country's so big, you'd have to go to different parts of the country, see, you know, what politicians, how much they're stressing COVID, so might be more all right, or go to places that people have the most pickup trucks, because then at least they can put you in the back. So pickup trucks are pretty good to get picked up in, in general. So if you have to encourage people to hitch so I, I can't say any age, obviously, it, everything's at your own risk, everything. It, it depends. Age is less so of an issue in certain respects. Um, definitely be aware if you're male or female. There was one young woman who was 18 and hitchhiking, train hopping. She was very smart, had a lot of wit, had been doing it for six months already. But she was dressed androgynously. So she was dressed in flannel, had dreadlocks. You couldn't tell whether she was... was Probably attracted, but you couldn't tell from a distance whether she was a guy or a girl. And I think that definitely helped out a little bit. Um, you you kind of want to look messy enough, but not too messy. <laughs> so messy enough that you know, maybe there's a little bit of an edge to you, but not so messy that you're that it looks like you're bedraggled and you're just going to be trouble. Alex. I want to thank you so much for joining us for another edition of Somerville Connects. And Sarah, I want to thank you for joining us as well. This is great. Okay. And, uh, you know, um, it's always great to meet new and exciting people. And thank you for taking us on your journey. Definitely. For hitching a ride across America. But before we leave, tell us again the name of your book and where we can find it. Great. You. Thanks so much, Judge. I really appreciate it. Um, Name of the book is Hitchin by Alex Silberman, H-I-T-C-H, apostrophe at the end. You can get it on Amazon, both in a paperback and in Kindle. And locally, you can get it at the Million Year Picnic in Harvard Square and the Harvard Bookstore. Also, you can get it at Seven Stars. And finally, you can get it at Winchester at Bookends. And, and the final thing at the end is the audiobook should be out soon on Audible. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you thank so you. much, and uh, bye for now, and thank you folks for joining us for another edition of Somerville Connect. Bye for now. Somerville Connects.
Somerville Connects.